So thank you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transit. Uh, if you're watching this on Twitch, it's at a weird time. If you're watching this on YouTube, I mean, the times are never standardized there. And uh, the topic for today is going to be about how rapid transit changes the geography of a city. Um, to be followed, um, I hope, by a video about how high-speed rail changes the geographic, uh, the geography and the geographic perception of a country. Um, or a system, but so far there's not really any meaningful cross-border high-speed rail. And yes, I'm aware that Eurostar and Talis exist. Um, so, when I so so this is going to be very much centering local and regional transit and not uh, intercity. Um, so it's really about a city or city region and how it changes in the presence of rapid transit. And on Google Earth already, I have uh, an image of a city that I have still lived in, in longer than anywhere else in my adult life, although Berlin will actually overtake it. In, uh, my Actually in 2023, I mean, very end of 2023, but technically, yeah, 2023, I moved to New York. No, 2024, I moved to New York, 4th of August. Yeah, 4th of August 2006 and departed um, 15th of July, uh, 15th of July 2011 and I moved to Berlin the 19th of February 2019, so to, uh, so for the same uh, number of days, not counting vacation days as not living in a city, I would need to be uh, late January 2024. So we're going to talk mostly about these two cities, um, but also about more auto-oriented ones um, as, some, as some kind of comparator. So in New York, um, first of all, New York, partly because it's huge, but partly because New York has rapid transit at the urban scale, but not the suburban scale. Um, Path exists. Um, I, I, I do meetings in the city with people who live in Jersey City. I've even on my second most recent trip, even ventured out to Jersey to meet other people, socially. But it's not that common. Um, especially not beyond path range. Why? Because if I'm in the city, then I'm not going to venture to, let's say, Fort Lee. Can Fort Lee be accessed on mass rent? Yes, there are buses. But it's not very convenient. Um, and, um, and in Jersey, sometimes they go to the city, but usually in the suburbs, they... Uh, for for the most part, we're in Jersey, outside, let's say, Jersey City, maybe the rest of Hudson County, maybe Newark. Essentially, you should think of it as just an auto-oriented region. Yes, one with the commuter rail, but auto-oriented. Um, so this is really city. In Berlin, it's city and suburban parts. Um, so what this means is how this affects the geography or where people live, work, and play. Um, but... Um, mostly the latter two so not so much where people w live now that obviously matters rapid transit makes it easier for areas that are opened by rapid transit to develop and not just develop but develop densely um this what i'm going to zoom in about um upper manhattan this is 1900s dod transit-oriented development the term did not exist at the time because all development in big cities was transit oriented, maybe streetcars, and in this case, the subway. This is part of the first subway, opened 1904. Uh, buildings here would have been, uh, so some of the earlier ones would have been early, mid 1900s. Um, and, um, uh, and the same is true of, uh, uh, of maybe uh, this part of Harlem, this part of Washington Heights, 1900s, 1910s. Um, and uh, this could also be done densely, which is not something that you can really do with auto-oriented development. So the live part does matter. How does it matter? It makes density more viable. Um, now bear in mind, this is we're talking 1900s, 1910s, and historically in 1900s, 1910s, the United States did not have zoning. Nor in the United States was there zoning. The first zoning resolution in the United States was actually in New York, 1916 but the density limits were very loose. The main purpose of the zoning uh, resolution of 1916 was to regulate building shapes, um, regulate land use to keep um, industrial uses, um, which 
were said to be noxious. This was not about anything that we would today view as uh, toxic. This was garment sweatshops. It was about the fact that the workers at these garment sweatshops were often uh, Jewish and the sort of people who passed these laws were um, elite uh, Protestants who were kind of anti-Semitic. Um, so it was viewed as racial pollution, not real pollution. So um, this was about keeping these sweatshops away from ritzy shopping districts. Oh, yo. Um, and um, But the density caps were loose, and in the absence of mass transit, it was absolutely legal to build dense, te- um, new uh, tenements. Many were, in fact, built, not right next to the subway. Um, so these are um, six-story buildings. Um, they're called new law because you might be able to tell that there's enough space there for uh, garbage collection. Maybe there's a little internal courtyard where there's a door that lets you get out. Um, it's the 1901 law. Um, is distinct from the old law, um, 1879. Um, that would not have been available in a neighborhood that only developed in the 1900s, but maybe we can look for examples in the village for the benefit of people who here New Yorkers use the expressions old law and new law. Um, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. New law, new law, old law, old law, old law, old law. Old law, it's like very narrow uh, uh, openings that essentially just exist as light wells um, without any place to take out the garbage. The reason the new law was passed was that people would differentiate garbage into these and this was unsanitary. Um, and also a fire risk. And so um, the... Um, so you could absolutely build a new low tenement not near the subway, but why would you? People were trying to get to work. Yes, um, missing. You are right. Missing middle isn't economical in places where housing is unaffordable, um, like in New York. In fact, so by the way, th- I'm, I'm going to go on a tangent, which I do on every uh, stream. These are not focused five minute YouTube videos or one minute shorts. Um, so for the benefit of people who don't know. Um, missing middle is something that I keep saying is not actually missing, except in Canada. Um, it's a specific kind of density that is less dense than what I just showed you. Remember, these are not high rises. Okay, these are built. I mean, these are maybe high rise projects, but look at how much open space there is between them. This is post war urban renewal. Um, the kind of traditional pre war environment is where it's now in vogue again is something like this. So mid-rises, six-story buildings. I used to live here. Um, This one maybe is nine stories, I don't remember. Um, um, And um, again, pretty densely packed, not much space between the buildings. And uh, so so this is not middle. Again, it's mid-rise, but it's not middle. It's actually very dense. Um, The population density of these if a, if a block has something like this in its entirety, um, and it's all residential, so not, let's say, university uses, you're hitting 50,000 people per square kilometer in such a block. Um, so again, very dense. Um, missing middle is between that density and single family density. This is Levittown, the most archetypical um, single family um, residential um, racially segregated suburb in America. Um, So single family houses, these are all single family houses. Historically, black people were not allowed to buy them. Um, And um, missing middle is things that are somewhere in between. I'm gonna show you some New York examples. The neighbor, actually, I'm gonna show you Kew Gardens Hills because it's the neighborhood that I am most familiar with. Um, So it's buildings that are not single family. Um, There might be some single family buildings, but first of all, they're not Detached. You might be able to tell that these are atta- semi-detached. It's two buildings to a lot. Uh, sorry, two buildings are attached to each other, and then they're detached from the others. Um, also, I don't think it's one family taking all three floors here. I think it's one family per floor. Um, in New England, it's actually really common to have farms like this. Um, three floors of a detached building often... Uh, each is a different apartment. Sometimes one floor is one apartment, the other two are another apartment. Um, row houses, this is called missing middle density. Um, 
It's called, people call it missing middle because it is not very common in recent transit-oriented development. It is also owing to Canadian high uh, Canadian dense development being less traditional and more modern, largely absent from Canada, which is, uh, which leads people to kind of moralize this as what Canada needs to uh, make housing more affordable and have more transit-oriented development. Um, and then it's more or less like gentle density because it's somehow not gentle to live in Manhattan. Um, yeah, cause, um, no, actually, more, um, 75% of San Francisco is own single family, but I mean, the, so the idea is to replace, so the missing middle discourse is replacing single family with missing middle, except the single family is in auto oriented regions. And this is where we're circling back to our original, not even our original topic, our original aside. The issue is that you see when you build very densely with cars the congestion levels shoot through the roof um like cars are low capacity mode um the um capacity that you're getting out of a four track subway line like um on lux in new york which has a lot of compromises on capacity um, compared with, let's say, Moscow or um, London or Paris. In New York, it's 30,000 people per direction per hour. Um, and that's on, and, and that's when you have one track. So it's going to be, the one track is going to carry 30,000 people per hour in the, in the direction that it takes. If it's a double track line, it's 30,000 per direction. If it's a four track line, and this is a, four track line it's sixty thousand um this, i don't think the sixty thousand was achieved before second avenue opened second avenue subway opened but pretty close actually these lines were critically crowded and uh this doesn't quite fit as a single uh as a single deck um beneath lux which is a 24 meter road but uh i mean it's a 24 meter wide road but um it would fit under a 30 meter wide road and parts of it do fit under Lux. So, so what this means is that this street can carry with a subway 60,000. And to put things in perspective, the highway lane is about 2,000. About maybe slightly less than 2,000 cars per hour, slightly more than 2,000 people per hour. Um, cars in practice are single occupant mode for urban travel. Um, people do carpool, but it's rare and it tends to be only in cases when you can't afford your own car. Um, I mean, yes, there are environmarders who do that, but transit mass transit is not mostly an environmarder mode. In New York, the average income for people who drive alone to work and for people who take mass transit to work are basically the same. And so, um, the, um, and so in practice, cars are a single occupant mode and Lux and the subway in Lux is equivalent capacity to, um, 30 freeway lanes in each direction. If it's street lanes, it's much more than that. Streets are lower capacity than freeways. Um, there are no 30 freeway lanes in each direction here. Not even close. Um, there aren't the, I don't know close to 100, maybe 80 or something, street lanes in each direction that you need for this. No, it's not even close. So subways are just so much higher capacity than roads that when the subways shut down, there are two things that can happen. The first is that you're gonna have massive gridlock and the second is if people prepare in advance, then they know not to take trips. Um, they know not to travel in in, in, into the congested core. They know to like shift travel away from rush hour. They know to work from home, to, to stay at home if possible. Um, usually it's something, it, 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 it's strategies that are actually pretty common when there's a very well telegraphed um, closure of a major transportation artery. Um, I don't know to what extent that's true of uh, mass transit because that's never gonna be closed long-term. Um, not when there's actual commuting happening. Maybe it's gonna be closed. Maybe there's gonna be a weekend closure Maybe in Paris, they like doing summertime closures in August when the entire city empties. Um, but 
not when there's commuting. Maybe they sometimes call the freeway to do some works, but again, that's going to be very well telegraphed in advance. Bosses are not necessarily the most compassionate people in the world, but when they see in the news that people are constantly reminding everyone the freeway will be closed on these days, um, and the bosses probably are going to drive in the city too, so they're familiar with freeway pain, they're, they're actually sufficiently sympathetic that instead of gray luck, you just have reduced trips. Um, now the question is, can you do it permanently? The answer is no, because eventually you stop having a city. And that's the point of mass transit. So the first uh, um, insight is again, where people live and where people live, they can live more densely. Um, this density um, gets not quite two, but very close to the capacity of six subway lines so there will be manhattan and the bronx the upper uh, uptown manhattan and the bronx have three four track subway lines to get to mid to their midtown jobs the um, lux um broadway and then eighth and then central park west recently second avenue is also open it's two track um and uh, this would just not be possible with cars. Um, the, the parking, uh, you essentially would need to turn literally all of Midtown Manhattan into parking. You would need to, they make sense as, as um, missing middle makes sense as um, the kind of your base suburban development in areas where you don't have demand for more. So let's call it half a kilometer from the commuter train station. Whereas 200 meters from it, you have bigger buildings. Um, and the, the reason it's missing in Canada, in Canada they don't grade, in Canada it's something like high rises on the same block as the subway, maybe the block behind and beyond that it's, it drops to a single family. Um, but anyway, the, the issue is that, the, so this density is only possible with mass transit. When you try to have auto-oriented density, you, have, you get a gridlock. Um, now obviously you can have things that are, are not like a shack in the woods density with cars that's absolutely viable the um density of uh los angeles county is about a it's a little more i think than a thousand per square kilometer um and that includes pretty unpopulated parts i think the built-up area density there is maybe two thousand two point five thousand and technically new york is less if you include like this part of the suburbs in the urban area calculation, but most people don't live there. They live here and here it's much denser than that. And so this affects where people live, but that's not how it changes the geography of the city. This is a compression. This actually allows the city to grow denser, but how does it, ch but th the main issue is it changes how people travel. Um, so it's not people are traveling to the same places, um, but from less dispersed destinations. No. Um, so I said live, work, play, I discussed live and now we're going to discuss work and then we're going to discuss play so work um when you have cars any direction is viable in fact you might want to avoid city center because of congestion and parking difficulties and this way in areas that become more auto-oriented as happened in the united states in the um third quarter of the 20th century jobs moved to the suburbs for um more space. Um, this often happened earlier, especially for industry. Um, factories starting in the roughly 1910s, 1920s became very space intensive because electrification trucks made it uh, just easier to do a very large big box style factory. Uh, but um, in the 1960s and 70s, there was also suburbanization of office jobs. Um, for example, um, before there was Silicon Valley, the place where a lot of tech was happening was Route 128. There was something called the Massachusetts Miracle when Boston recovered from the weak Northeastern economy of the 1970s, but it was not the city that recovered so much as specific suburban areas. Um, roughly this stretch um, that is signed as I-95, what is locally known as Route 128, the beltway around Boston. Um, so you can kind of zoom in and see lots of office parks there. Why are these office parks here? Um, or, or in general, uh, along Route 128 and not um, in Boston? Because, well, there's good freeway access. 
but also they can't have a giant midtown Manhattan scale or even downtown Boston scale central business district because there would be too much congestion. So it's more spread out. Um, it's spread out in all directions, um, but some directions are more favored than others. And these directions are generally where higher income people live. Now, this isn't as stark in the case of Boston because Boston, like most of the Northeast, does have dire- Boston does have directionality, but it's weaker than the observation that the city is poorer than the suburbs. Um, Again, there is directionality, so maybe going due south, southeast, the the south shore in general is poorer. So um, at this point, it's people who are not actually poor, but maybe still sort of ideas workers or working class. And um, they they have like a big ID poll of we're not poor um, in, let's say, Quincy. Um, they do get actually wealthier and like along the literal shore around here, but this area is lower middle class maybe. And then this is wealthier. This is a lot wealthier. Um, this is roughly how the directionality works and the jobs generally go where the rich people go. Um, it's imperfect, but this is generally the pattern. Um, so you have spatial mismatch with cars with mass transit that is less likely. Now, Boston does have mass transit. Um, which is why this effect of Route 128 or Silicon Valley in Northern California or many such examples all over the US as well as Europe, it's happened less so in Boston than in most other American cities, um, but it has happened. And um, so, um, so public transit lets you have a big central business district. Why? Because, yeah, it's congested. Yeah land is expensive but it's the best location if people are relying on the system because if i'm gonna put because um let me sh- okay i'm not gonna check email on stream uh let's do a new york city subway map actually um and this is good especially because it is messy um there are much cleaner maps out there like let's say that of uh usually the maps have come out of the soviet bloc and i'm counting china there um, are very neat in that it's a bunch of lines inter- all intersecting in one place. I mean, not literally one station, but one obviously central place. And in New York, there's a lot of mixing and matching. And my point is that even with the mixing and matching of a map like this, um, even with all of that, there are locations that are easier, much easier than others, and that's essentially the Manhattan core. Um, jobs here can be accessed from the entire city, pretty much. I mean, I'm not counting Staten Island, but um, even from Staten Island, especially if it's more lower, if it's more lower Manhattan. Now, bear in mind. I mean, it's not like the every. It's not just. It's not like Midtown is one point. Midtown is not a point. Mid, like, especially not the Manhattan core, which is Midtown and Lower Manhattan. Um. So yeah, I mean, you can say that maybe people from Brooklyn have an easier time getting to jobs here. Um. In fact, I I, I know, um, of a certain uh, book publisher, Tor, that moved its offices um, specifically to Lower Manhattan because they polled their um, workers and it turned out that they disproportionately lived in Brooklyn for which a more southerly location had better access. More common it is to be the exa- to be in the exact opposite situation. Workers are more likely to be coming from Queens or uptown Manhattan or maybe the Bronx and for them a more northerly location that is Midtown is better. North of Midtown, it's much harder to get East to West, um, there are no connections to Queens. So um, so essentially this area, mostly Midtown and Lower Manhattan, are these are where the subway lines converge. So these become the best places to locate. In this way, where people work, the answer is much more likely to be in city center. Um, and if you have an especially complex system like New York, then it's also likely that if they don't work in city center, yeah, maybe they work in big off- in, in suburban auto-oriented office parks. As I said, Jersey should not be viewed as part of the system. Jersey has commuter trains that are not urban rapid transit quality. Um, this is not Europe, unfortunately. Um, and so the jobs in Jersey, yeah, they exist to some extent in downtown Newark, but downtown Newark is much weaker because there's much less of a mass transit system that makes it um, such a good location. And so 
yeah, this still exists, but where do jobs locate in Jersey if not downtown New York? Well, maybe the waterfront Jersey City because it's close to Manhattan to some extent. Um, but more likely, it's going to be places that are completely suburbanized, sometimes to the point of being de-urbanized. Um, for example, um, um, general now some of it is not just cars. I mean, general. I mean, Edison is called Edison because this is where, like, Edison and Woodbridge are where Edison invented General Electric. Um, and bear in mind, General Electric, yeah, it had factories here. It had offices in New York. But there's still a lot of suburbanization of jobs here, and you can literally see the industries, especially, um, and the warehouses. Um, but also, normal offices are here um, in, in this entire area. Now, the point is that when you have a transit city, not only is the central business district, in this case, Manhattan, or it could be downtown Boston, downtown San Francisco, the Chicago Loop, that is much stronger. But also, um, what happens when people don't work there? Now, in New York, it's the best example of a transit city in North America. New York actually has pretty strong centers that are not the center. Um, and it's kind of weird that people talk about how New York is monocentric around Manhattan and other places might be more polycentric. But actually, New York is very, has two pretty strong not Manhattan centers um, defined, and I'm going to show you the map again, by where the other subway lines converge. Now, it's not going to be Coney Island, it's too far out. It's not going to be Broadway Junction here in East New York because that's also kind of too far out. Um, also, the area is horrifically poor, and that's not usually where you build jobs. Rather, it's downtown Brooklyn, um, which is the historical center for Brooklyn. And uh, more recently, I think this is just a coincidence of how the lines were built, Long Island City. Uh, these are near tied for second largest business district in the region, counting Lower Manhattan and Midtown as a single mush of the Manhattan core other than two, um, which is more... It's just a matter of um, data quality issues with something called with an app. It's measured through something called on the map, which um, specifically chokes on certain public sector jobs and it kind of over assigns uh, public sector jobs to Brooklyn Borough Hall. Um, and it's entirely unclear with um, how many people in the block are actually there and how many aren't. Uh, and that. <laughs> Sorry, that exactly makes a difference between downtown Brooklyn and Long Island City. But again, it's probably about 100,000 workers each. Uh, Manhattan Corps being 2, 2 million, so it's still a very sharp decrease. And yet, 100,000 is not bad. I mean, in Los Angeles, people talk to me about how Century City is the second downtown, and, that's, and, and that was, people were, I think, 33,000. So the point of a transit city is that people live, people can live more densely. Um, because the congestion, the, the point at which the system gets too congested is much higher than the point at which you're adding the 26th freeway lane and the costs are going through the roof and people are still going to just drive farther into the, the suburbs to search for lower parking fees. Now where they work, it means they work more downtown. Um, and now, New York, now, I'm so far giving you a North American, an American picture. Talk a little bit about Canada, which is largely the same as what I just said. Um, but now let's move on to York. And I'm going to do that before I go on to where they play, because that matters. Because you can have strong central business districts that look extremely different from each other. So in a place like New York, you have a famously high-rise business district. But now let's look at a European city. Actually, before I, actually let's do Munich first and then Paris. I'm going to... It's going to reinforce my point. So we're going to zoom in on Munich and uh, see certain things. So this is the old section of the city. Um, the city is actually quite monocentric around city center, which is not just the old section, it's a little bit bigger. Um, going maybe as far as Ostbahnhof, there's a bunch of businesses and offices there. So let's zoom in there and you might notice that there are no high rises. Um, it's all mid rises. And let's go to the historic center. Can you see tall buildings here? The answer is no. Uh, maybe our Hauptbahnhof. I think there are buildings that might be a little bit taller, by which I mean something like 12 floors instead of six. But even that's kind of rare. 
yeah, this building looks like 30 something meters. So yeah, it would be about 10, 12 floors. I mean, that's not actually impressive if you're used to the Americas or if you're used to East Asia or if you're used to South Asia or if you're used to the Middle East. Europe is just weird. Europe is just weird. Um, Europe doesn't like high rises. Does it mean that the city is polycentric? No, it does not. Munich is a famously monocentric system. Um, the jobs are here. Why are they here? Well, you might be able to tell with the black lines, which represent railroads, um, that this is where the rail lines converge. There's the, in Munich, as I, as I mentioned, New York's commuter rail system is not proper urban rapid transit. It charges excessive fares. The frequency is very weak. Um, the coverage is not very good and there's no integration with buses or with the subway. And so people really only take it for nine to five jobs where they drive for all other purposes. This is gonna matter when you talk about play. Um, whereas in Munich, what they did with the commuter trains is that they um, run them very frequently. They're, um, within the city, the core, this is this tunnel, the s tunnel, is actually run at extremely high frequencies so that people can use it as if it's part of the subway. And even some of the combinations of branches can be used this way. It's only until you get very far out then you need to start planning your trip on 20 minute frequencies. Bear in mind, in New York, the lines are often hourly. Um, and so in Munich, you have this commuter rail branch, uh, it's not branch, you're a commuter rail trunk. It's critically overcrowded. They should have built a second one a generation ago, but they're only starting to do so now and it's being further delayed and uh, the budget is escalating. But also there are three subway trunk lines and again, they all converge in this area. So where's the best place to build a, an office? Somewhere in this area. I mean, maybe you're not allowed to build high rise because of uh, European planning and preservation rules, but you can cram in a lot of people into an eight story office building. That's, I mean, maybe not if it's just gonna be a couple blocks, but this is not a couple of blocks, pretty big area. I mean, still very much a city center, but it's not literally a radius of a 15 minute walk. Um, and again, Paris is gonna be exactly the same. Paris, I mean, has so few high rises that they have names that people have heard, like Tour Montparnasse. This is the tallest building in Paris, building as opposed to structure, I wish it would be Eiffel. This is an actually in use office building. Um, it's about the only one. Um, and it's not even in the Paris Central Business District. The Paris Central Business District lying instead here. Does Paris have a strong central business district? Yes, it absolutely does. Um, and um, because my French data is less granular than my American data, my American data with on the map is block level. My French data is not. My French data is municipal level, maybe arrondissement. So I can tell you roughly that um, within the same geography, which is 100 square kilometers, why 100? Because that's approximately Paris plus La Défense. Um, I don't remember the job count, but I believe 37% of Ile de France jobs are within Paris and La Défense. And uh, in New York City, you do the same area. So 100 square kilometers, I think it's 35 or 36%. Um, so it would be the core part of the city, um, including as a National Island city and downtown Brooklyn, not just Manhattan, um, maybe Jersey City waterfront. I don't exactly remember what I did, but it's about 35, 36%. So about the same as Paris. And remember, Paris basically does not have high rises. Paris is a European city. And yet it is, it actually has a very strong center. There's a very strong center in Paris. And, it's, and I don't mean the high rises at La Défense. I mean, this is the central business district. It's entirely six, seven, eight, nine story buildings, but you pack them and you have buildings that are mostly just commercial and you can have pretty high job density like this. Um, again, it's not optimal, but it's something that does kind of work. Um, so you have these really strong centers. Um, maybe in, in the case of Paris, you also have strong transit oriented sub centers. And again, I don't just mean La Défense. I mean, things like Marne la Vallée or Sergi, like they built these new towns um, simultaneously with commuter lines. Um, so you do have this kind of office sprawl, but it's more, um, but it's more, um, rail oriented. But the point is, it's not that they made their sprawl more rail oriented, it's that they just have less job sprawl than 
do places that don't have mass transit. So this is how public transit influences how people work. They're much likelier to work in the core. It makes the region less polycentric to the point that mass transit is often a poor fit for regions that are, for historic reasons, forced to be polycentric. And and again, and, and we're in Europe already, so let's talk about Euro the biggest European examples, the, the Rhine Ruhr and um, uh, Grenzkip Randstad, which is actually the second largest polycentric region in Europe after the Rhine Ruhr, but is very bike oriented. Uh, no, we're going to go to Poland um, and look at uh, Katowice. Um, so here, this is really an agglomeration and something like seven or eight distinct city cores. Um, it's Duisburg, Essen, Bochum, Dortmund, Düsseldorf, Düsseldorf Wuppertal, Köln, and Bonn. So, I guess four. And, um, and uh, not four, eight. And uh, they have their own independent rapid transit systems. Um, the rapid transit systems are actually pretty good usage, but for anything cross-regional, People, people. I mean, people can take the train, but mostly they just drive. Um, the total rail ridership in this region is about 11 million people. Is I think a little more than a billion people a year, like maybe a billion point three, um, which is not actually that impressive by German standards. Like I think Berlin hits about that, maybe a bit less with five million. Um, so per capita, it's not very good. Um, not as good as let's say Berlin or Hamburg or Munich, where there is a single city core. Uh, and the reason is that if jobs, yeah, even if it's a bunch of different city cores for like Essen, Dortmund, and, and, and so on, um, people might want to go to a different core. And so unless they live on the one line connecting, let's say, Essen and Dortmund, um, if they are in a good rail line to downtown Essen, maybe it's better for them to drive to get to Dortmund. And in that case, they might just get the car to have the ability to go to more places, to, to more city centers. And then once you get a car, the value of the um, transit networks, uh, of the transit network shrinks, the value of downtown shrinks because it's more congested. Um, and um, it's also, and it's even truer in Poland um, with this region, it's called um, Upper Zilesia. It's actually the biggest metropolitan area in Poland, it's bigger than Warsaw. I mean, not much bigger, but somewhat bigger than Warsaw. Warsaw is a very transit-oriented region. I think half the trips there are done by public transit. Um, and this is mostly not the subways, it's trams, buses, trolley buses, I think. I don't actually remember if they have trolley buses in Warsaw, I'm going to check. The answer is... Okay, no, they don't have trolley buses anymore, which is very sad. But um, the um, but in but in so in Warsaw, yeah, it's a combo of all of these, and they get not trolley buses, and they get high ridership. People mostly don't have cars. Katowice is like, I mean, maybe not people who work in downtown Katowice. Katowice being the main center of the region, but Katowice again in the region. Remember, Warsaw and Katowice have about the same. Metro populations, maybe Katowice is a bit bigger. The population of um, Warsaw is uh, 1.9 million. The population of Katowice, which should be clear as a, a metro area about the same size, or maybe even bigger, maybe definitely bigger, is less than 300,000. Um, so the situation is, I mean, it, it, uh, I think it descends from historic coal mines. Um, that happened with different settlements that are, arose around them. And so the issue is that, um, yes, there are, there's a rapid transit system connecting all of these in commuter rail, but it's not actually going to be helpful when you're so polycentric that um, you might need to be working in Gliwice or in Bitom and you're not sure which. So yeah, you're going to get a car. Poland is therefore one of the most, I, th I think Poland might actually be the most motorized non-microstate in Europe. I think actually overtook the traditional car culture, car culture capital of Europe, which was Italy, um, with more vehicles per capita than, let's say, Germany or France or the Nordic countries. Um, so this is why I'm down on polycentrism. It doesn't actually get you to 
any kind of sustainability. It sounds more modern while also being more eco, but it actually isn't. Um, so mass transit encourages kind of model centricity um, in places like Munich, Warsaw, Stockholm, um, and Berlin. Now, I haven't talked about Berlin yet, and I kind of want to. Berlin has a weird situation with how cent- with its structure of its center. Reason being, I would characterize Berlin as monocentric, but the center is almost the entire inner city, which is tens of square kilometers. The um, ring here. So the line, so the railway here is called the ring. Um, it encloses about 100 square kilometers, and the jobs are almost always inside. Um, now, they can be anywhere inside, I mean, not literally anywhere inside, but a bunch of different centers, often along the historic commuter line. So, uh, Potsdamer Platz was a historic one, um, but then it was kind of destroyed by division. Um, Alexander Platz was the eastern one, City West was the western one, then post wall Potsdamer Platz became great again there are uh like really everything here in this part of meta is pretty commercial so this would be Swedish also um kind of an ami- you, you you take kind of a pseudopod up to uh like, like an ami- like an amoeba up to Hauptbahnhof. then you maybe hop off a little bit and you and there's a bunch of jobs developing around the sign um they're including the amazon tower and so um it's polycentric in the sen- within the ring but there's so much outside the ring but it's largely residential people outside the ring move sorry travel to work inside the ring often so often and so um where people work is still in a center in a central area polycentricity does not mean all neighborhoods are equal it doesn't it means that inner neighborhoods are just stronger than outer ones that's where they work now let's talk about play because that is also matter. That also matters, and we're already in Berlin with the camera, so let's talk about this. I go to a bunch of queer events, and I go to a bunch of gaming events, and these are two different crowds. Um, and something that I've noticed is that meetups, meetups, are p- actually I've, I don't. No, I have. Okay, I want to say I don't remember any meetup that's outside the ring. It's false. I do remember a meetup that's outside the ring, but it's just outside the ring, like around here, and that's rare. Usually the meetups are not just within the ring, but Mitte, maybe Friedrichstein, maybe Kreuzberg, maybe Prenzlauer. It's much more likely to be in this blob than here. For meetups, here it's kind of out of fashion, West Berlin. Very wealthy, but out of fashion. Um, and. Um, and so this is, and the, and the meetings, again, it's all here. Um, events tend to be around here. Uh, exceptions are rare and notable. I don't know about studies. Um, it's a really good question, Comrade. I don't know formal studies about this. Um, it's something that you can get if you um, read the New Transit City Typology um, that I learned from uh, Paul Barter's thesis. Um, but he studied, but uh, Paul Barter studies Asia and the sort of people who think polycentricity is more moral than monocentricity look down on Asia. Um, or you can just show people, like, I mean, like, you can show, like, in Asia, you can just show people that live a place like Singapore has a very clear central business district with the high rise being in one place, and then a place like Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok or Jakarta doesn't. Um, the high rises are maybe in a central area, but they're strewn all over, um, and there's not as much structure to it. Whereas in Berlin, they're actually ooh yeah yeah Lamberto is pretty is pretty good at this. Um, um, a lot of it is drinking water on stream. No, a lot a lot of it is about. Um, the fact that it's not just centers that are randomly around the ring. I mentioned a bunch of neighborhoods to you, and note, Potsdamer Platz here is where uh, the commuter trains, well, one line of the commuter trains meets one line of the subway. Um, and bo- uh, and the subway line here is all it's the oldest in the city, um, part of the oldest system in the city system. Uh, Alexanderplatz, three subway lines and a commuter line. So there's 
one subway line to commuter lines. Um, you go a little further south to Urtel and Linden, it's a, you have another subway line. Um, City West here, it was so chosen because it was it had the commuter rail and it was where it was intersecting um, one of the older subway lines and thereafter a third subway line was built through this area to connect different areas of West Berlin north and south of the wall without passing through Mitte. It was mostly for north of the wall. South of all, they did something else in the inferior. Um, like for Neukölln. And so the... Um, so it's always where the junctions are. And so there's a lot of structure to that density already that makes it very convenient to get there by the train. Well, why? Because when it was built, people expected to get to work by train. So obviously, where would the jobs be located where it's easier to get to by train? And the same that era, I don't even mean in the kind of return to tradition of the 1910s. City West is a Cold War creation. Um, they were building freeways here. They were. This is a Cold War freeway built in the city where, to be very clear, if you drove outside, you're get, you're hitting communism. This was not an intercity freeway that became congested. This was in, intended exclusively for the use of urban driving. Um, and it did induce a lot of urban driving. And there are parking lots in, in very auto-oriented areas next to these. And they keep expanding this freeway um, because Berlin Espada is that terrible. And yet... That's per, that it's it, it's part of the system, but it's relatively speaking much less important than let's say the freeway of an American city, especially a one that's not a historic transit city. Um, let's call it Houston. It's not a historic transit city or Atlanta, Los Angeles, uh, Miami, as opposed to let's say New York, Chicago, things like that. And so the and so the point is that. Um, it creates a distinguished location, not just for work, but also for events. Now, the events are probably not going to be as laser focused on the mass transit system. And the reason is that um, if I go with a bunch of friends, yeah. So if I if I want to go with a bunch of friends to play board games, I said play, and I literally mean play in this point in this case. Um, the board game community center does not have the money that Amazon has. What does this mean? It means that the community center is uh, is in Friedrichstein. I can, I mean, it's on meetup.com. It's, I'm, not, I'm not doxing myself or something. It's literally on meetup.com where I'm going. It is a uh, place called Rudi, which is um, model, um, here on Model Zornstrasse. Uh, and uh, where it hits Rudolfstrasse. Um, I think it's, um, I want to say that it is here, that it is this building. Um, and so, um, but maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, I think it is this building. And so, um, Look at where the train stations are here, here. So again, close, but not literally at them. Where is Amazon building the Amazon Tower? I um. Ooh, you can already see it rising here. Why? Amazon has money, and board gamers maybe individually have money, but we don't have Amazon money. We're not spending, and even if we did, we don't. We're not spending Amazon money on where we play board games. I mean, we do have some sense of proportion. And so the point is that, um, where people put. Um, play is kind of it kind of fits in between where people work um but the point is that it's still within city center because people who have chosen to arrange their lives around the possibility of living without a car and taking the train to the city they can still take the train to the city i mean maybe they need to walk a little more to go to board games or maybe they do it right after work and so they maybe take this maybe do um three trips a day instead of two or four so nor two two trips if you, if you go you go um let's say home to work home three trips would be home to work to play to work um and that but this is something that exists based on based on the mass transit system so the mass transit system makes this more likely that the event will be more central as well this is something that i've seen in new york city um 
they do tra tend to place um, meetings in more central areas. Um, I, I've known a bunch of people, none of them lived anywhere near there or worked anywhere near there who would go, come to a cafe, um, I think it's Fifth Avenue and 28th Street to play board games. Uh, but that is much more haphazard. Why, remember, in New York, as I said, the city is transparent, but the suburbs are not. So the suburbs will have their own sub-communities where they have conventions, for example, that are very far, um, or where they have meetups that are very far and expect you to drive in, and then people worry a lot about parking. And I actually encountered this in Boston. Boston, the entire region is pretty auto-oriented by European standards, not by American ones, but yes, by European ones. And so um, the work is often still in city center, or near center areas like um, where all the like uh, Tech Square kind of around the MIT campus or Back Bay or um, Longwood. However, um, the play tends to be um, sufficiently suburbanized that people will ask me about parking. And when I talk to Ronald Larp in Back Bay, people came, but they did complain about parking about parking rates. Um, and um, so in Boston, by the way, downtown Boston is this. Back Bay, second biggest job center. I think third biggest would be here, Tech Square slash Kendall, a right next to MIT campus. Longwood is just a medical area. Um, these are the main job centers. I think there's also, I guess, uh, the seaport is growing, but it's kind of weird. And it's also not as big as these. So um, Harvard is a big employer by itself. But, um, uh, but the issue is that, um, the play in a city with weaker trends, especially off-peak, like Boston, is one in which people would prefer to run things maybe at someone's home. And where is someone's home? Well, someone's home is not likely to be very central. I mean, centralization is for destinations and origins. Centralization is for jobs, not residents. And if it's in someone's home, yeah, they can live <coughs> in a transit accessible area, but people will still ask about parking and most people will drive. I mean, I feel like LARP's in Watertown. Again, someone's home. I'm going to show you where this person lives. I'm going to dox, but Watertown, not Kendall Square or anywhere in Cambridge even. Yeah, exactly. And so there's this idea that it's less moral to do um, monocentric development. And I mean, whatever. People want to be returned to tradition and pretend that return to tradition doesn't mean crusader or genocide. Be my guest. I mean, I'm resigned to like the fact that people outside Germany have like their own historic genocide heirs that they worship. But what I mean is that even people who talk a lot about mass transit specifically and about sustainability think that monocentricity is bad. Now, where do they think monocentricity is bad? I don't actually know. I mean, it's you, you, it's usually related to some kind of anti-capitalist critique, except you can be capitalist and positive. I mean, America is a pretty capitalist country, high inequality, lots of social problems. It's not very monocentric. Um, my suspicion, um, and, and, and it's not like I've done some kind of ethnography of the ethnographers or something, but my suspicion is that people associate the United States with both high rises and lack of sustainability. And so they assume that because America has high rises, it's more monocentric. It is in fact false. Um, uh, the United States is weakly centered, um, but it doesn't have strong city centers outside the places where mass transit is actually viable and therefore there's better sustainability. Um, in a place like Atlanta, um, to pick an example that's not even the most extreme in the United States, but is kind of a city where, yeah, there are two subway lines, but very few people use them. Uh, like to the point it doesn't really have mass transit. In Atlanta, yes, there are high rises. Quite a lot of these buildings are taller than anything you'll find in a European city center, but it's a tiny area, it's a couple blocks. Um, you go east and west, one stop out, you're already not quite historic downtown. Um, two stops out, it's single family houses. Um, and yeah, there's somewhat of a northwest axis here, so it's somewhat of a cherry pick. And yet, you should not have single family houses and parking lots a kilometer and a bit from city center, which would be not 
which would be five points. So here. Um, again, north south, it's not quite as small, but still, it's it's just a tiny. It's just a couple. Like in this area, it's a couple blocks that are high rise, and that's it. A European city center it would not be a couple blocks like this. It would be a large stretch of mid, of high density. Again, not high rise density, but high mid rise density. The kind that if you did it consistently for residential, you'll get two densities that exist in a handful of very dense first world neighborhoods, you know, the Upper East Side, the 11th arrondissement, the Champlain. Things are very noted for their density. And so, yeah, you can stack jobs there. It's not gonna be as efficient as high rise, but it's more efficient to have them stacked than to have just a couple high rise and then great to single family housing which should be very clear. I mean, the trains here exist. They're just, it's just zoning prohibits commercial uses in much of this, so it's single family. Um, and people cling to that as kind of historic preservation. So this is where I think people think that um, people, yeah, yeah, Philly isn't usually job sprawly. Don't ask me why, I don't know the history of why Philly has much more job sprawl than New York. I mean, New York, sure, but like Boston and Chicago. Um, San Francisco. Um, and so, no, police interest, is, so this is not going to be a rant against police interest, just a, just a point that mass transit remolds the city in its direction, and um, it, it makes where people live denser, it makes where people work more monocentric, um, or rather, more stronger centered, more strongly centered. Um, this means the main center is going to be much larger, but also mean the secondary centers to the point they exist are also going to be larger than in a place like Los Angeles. And um, it also means that where people play will be more centralized, um, which is nice because you can get bigger communities this way. And um, it's so you can essentially specialize better. Um, Berlin has many board game meetups. It's really nice. Um, some in English, some in German. I go to the English ones. Some focus more on one kind of game, some on others. They're in very different milieus. I, again, I prefer, I showed you where the one I prefer is it's the largest. Um, so there's the biggest selection of games, which means that if I'm in the mood for um, playing a social deduction game, I can play with the, sort of, with the people who play Secret Hitler every time and accuse other people of being Hitler. And if I am not in the mood for that, and I'm in the mood for a, for a Euro game, there are people who will play Race for the Galaxy with me I, I, I love Race for the Galaxy. I will play, I will play that, or I will play, um, or, or I will play Splendor, Azul. Um, I don't know what's wrong with the color scheme, and I'm worried because the color, because usually the color scheme thing also fucks the recording. But um, but the point is that, um, the, but but the point is that. I get bigger events this way. I get more. I mean, that's the point of city. That, 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 I think that's uh, Alain Berthold's main point against polycentricity, that he thinks polycentric, polycentricity is kind of villagization of the city. And he's not, cor he's not correct about it, but he's also not not correct about this, if that makes sense. Um, and so, the I mean, people do travel long distances in, for example, LA for specialized things okay in la you drive everywhere the mass trend the, the model split for commutes in la is i want to say three point something percent in the entire region with all of its actors and in berlin probably 10 times as much the city is 40 something the with the suburbs i think it's going to be low to maybe 33 34 percent and so um, the upshot is in LA, you drive everywhere. And so the distances are large and there's this kind of joke that it's um, something like a hundred villages in search of a city or something like that. But in LA, if I want to get something really special, like I want to get this really nice, I don't know, Sichuan cuisine, I can get it. I need to maybe drive a long distance, but I can get it. Now, by the way, I say Sichuan. I mean, I guess maybe in America, it's, it would not be as exotic at this point. Sichuan is very popular. It's very good cuisine. New York is 
full of them. There's a standard Sichuan restaurant tour in New York City. Message me, not on Twitter, please, but on Fetty, and they will do recommendations. Um, but, I mean, okay, different parts of China that don't, I mean, I think there's, I mean, I think uh, there's a Dintai Fung somewhere in Orange County. Or there used to be. Yeah, locations. Um, and these are suburbanized areas in America, so they're all going to be suburbanized locations. I guess we're showing you the American one. Okay, so let's do California. Um, so let, let's look at all of these locations. Okay, um, suburb. Um, Glendale is a dense for LA, by LA standard suburbs, but it, suburb um, notable for its Armenian uh, population. I think it might have the largest Armenian proportion of any place in America. It's like I think it's only thirty percent Armenian. So, if you're there, kindly do not deny genocide, and kindly do not suggest that there is something positive about um, the actions of uh, uh, Erdogan. Um, people will get mad at you, and they will be completely right to be so. And um, so, so this is Glendale, so pretty suburbanized, and Los Angeles proper is is Century City, so that's the um, uh, edge city that is pretty high rise, but it's very auto oriented, and it's not big enough to be a real city center. It's as I said, thirty something thousand jobs. Downtown LA is here, and it's much more than that, many more than that. And so, and you can see these places, um, Torrance. It's in, it, um, what is Torrance? It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's here. Like it's this kind of very heavily suburbanized region. Um, but you can drive there from one suburb to another. You can, you can drive. I mean, if I'm not in literally one of these, then I can just, I can, I, can, I mean, it's annoying, but it's not going to be a rush hour. And yeah, I can drive to Torrance and have delicious Huayang food. Um, it just so happens that if I'm in a transit city, of which there are no good European examples because there's no Dintai Fung in Europe as far as I remember, but let's say in Singapore, I can just walk or take the train there. Um, so for specialized things, yeah, um, people do go. Um, it's just usually for less specialized things, it's just so much less convenient that people do stick to smaller communities. It's kind of, and, and that is a little bit of a villagization, and this is a problem if you're like having variety in your life and if you like for example doing something that's not a knitting circle but something that draws from more than just the neighborhood and then something that involves having a very large variety of choice of what to play that is yeah yeah exactly exactly um and uh and also actors something i read a couple of years ago and very couple i mean like nine about the life of an actor in LA is that um, you audition and um, it's so I mentioned where people work right so if you have one consistent workplace you're okay um, you take a train there if there's a train if it's if it's LA there's hardly no train so you drive and that's normal there's actually a problem with people with inconsistent work locations for example um, people in, in the trades uh, might need to drive to a different to, to different job sites um, and usually they have tools so they drive. Um, and these tend to be pretty anti-livable uh, streets constituencies as a result, um, except for the ones that realize the congestion pricing makes their trips faster. More expensive, but faster and, it's, and, and, and on that they gain. Um, and so the, um, the and, and actors are one such example. Actors um, don't audition, don't, don't work out of one central place because um, yeah, if you're a, if you're an actor that people have heard of, then yeah, you have, you're on a film and you're in a film set consistently. But the average actor is not, like the, the average actor is not, who's in vogue right now? I'm gonna say George Clooney, but I'm, but George Clooney, Clooney is even more of a boomer than I am. Um, if you're not, a, if you're not a star people have heard of, then your life is most likely gonna be going to be auditions um, you're mostly going to be driving to auditions and then you're going to hit something if you're an average actor like you're going to hit something that's actually not very large if you're the sort of person who becomes a star you'll hit something bigger but the point is that you have to go to many different places in the city and so you need to drive and it's pretty brutal 
and um, there's often not enough parking, and you will. And, and one of the costs of doing business is, and this is what I read, however many years ago, is um, parking tickets. You, it, like parking tickets are part of the life of being an actor. I mean, yeah, you you, you pay them out of pocket. Um, I mean, teachers have it worse in not rich American school districts. They have to buy chalk and. Um, books and such for their students and the poor ones have to buy food for the students is the harrowing part but the um again usually out of pocket the district is never going to reimburse but the um but the point is that it's not something that um it, it, it is it, it's not something people don't do it's something that they do with difficulties um it's a congested cost in the same way that money is a cost and um or, or just a annoyance cost or the parking cost and this is something that is a, a real limitation of auto oriented cities and this is something where trans where mass transit is a solution just encourages people to place everything together and if you're to do mass transit and not place everything together you're getting atlanta levels of ridership atlanta let me actually check on that um what the length of marta is because um you can find maybe not subway but light trail yeah okay so seven seventy seven kilometers um in Mart at Marta. So it's about half as much as the Berlin U Bahn. Let me actually check Munich. Munich is a hundred kilometers. What Stockholm is also about a hundred kilometers, slightly more. So Atlanta has almost the same it is about half the network size of Berlin. Maybe two thirds that of Munich or Stockholm. The ridership is not half that of Berlin. It's not two thirds that of Stockholm. Not even close. Berlin pre Corona was something like five. I think it was five hundred and fifty million riders per year in Atlanta. Let's hope that they have uh, that they haven't updated the figures to twenty twenty one. They have updated the figures to twenty twenty one. Sucks. Yeah, so it was 50 million in 2021, would have been probably 100 something before. Or maybe not even 100. So, um, like one fifth of the ridership, that's. No, I mean, that's what happens when you try to retrofit rapid transit on something that. You know, and again, this is something that's really important to get right. Um, and, and the point of mass transit is that it helps densify the city, it helps get people to one place. Um, and the really most interesting thing also is that, is that in an especially large city, um, the direction matters. And this is something that might be a New York special. In New York, there's an east side versus west side difference arising purely from the fact that north of Manhattan, it's difficult to get cross town. There are buses. They're very slow. Um, and so, um, so for example, one of the things that Master Anza does is that communities tend to be elongated. Um, essentially what it does it, it, is it uh, shrinks the city along the direction, along the axis of the direction, which in Manhattan is more visible because it's consistently north-south, and by implication enlarges the city in the orthogonal direction, in this case east versus west. Um, and you can see this, for example, in um, community patterns. Um, so the main center of Black New York was historically Harlem, and then the second one was about first time percent. Um, so, so as more black people arrived in the city in the um, Great Migration, uh, or the latter stage of the Great Migration, the first stage, just Harlem, where did they go out of bed -Stuy? They didn't randomly go to places that are adjacent to bed -Stuy. They specifically went along the subway line. So they kept going east in this case, um, stretching up until Brownsville in East New York. Um, this is pretty common, and likewise, if you, if you think of gentrifiers, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't say ethnic groups because it's also, like, it's just subcultures. Gentrifiers are a subculture. I mean, it, it's kind of annoying because gentrification is not usually about the gentrifiers. It's about um, higher rents coming from housing shortages, but the gentrifiers are a group, even if it's weird to call them gentrifiers when gentrification is caused by other people. Um often who often identify oppositionally to the gentrifiers and so um 
the gentrifiers for um, move along communities. And you can see this, for example, in, again, New York, gentrification started building itself from the West Village and then moved to the East Village and then essentially moved into Brooklyn along the L. You can literally see um, the neighborhoods going around the L being some of the very few that are actually seeing black flight and white influx. Usually, supposedly gentrifying neighborhoods are getting less white. Um, I mean, it's people who are like middle-class newcomers to the city, but they're very likely to be people of color. Um, and the people who leave are often um, white people with a very, um, I shouldn't say ethnic, I mean, in New York it would be eth ethnic white, but it would be white people generally with the same ID poll as ethnic white, so local identity, um, neighborhood identity. And those are the ones who suburbanize because they kind of lose that identity and become American, like generic white American by identity. And where do generic white Americans live? Not here. Here. Lorraine. Westchester. Jersey. Um, and so the, and, and by Jersey, I mean generic white, so specifically not the Indian parts of Jersey um, or the um, Central American parts. Um, and so the, and, and so the point is that the subway kind of creates communities that are some, sometimes elongated, and that's fine. I mean, communities are created along roads, um, historically. Um, that's normal. It's just that it does mean that the city, the city's perception shrinks, uh, I mean, it shrinks, but it also gets weirded out by something that is that you can get through, like, some kind of Cartesian, Euclidean, you know, Euclidean or, or, or Manhattan distance. Um... So anyway, that's how rapid transit impacts where people live, where they work, where they uh, play, and some caveats, especially also about, uh, or, or complications about um, directionality um, um, alongside versus orthogonally to the mass transit lines. Um, I will take questions now, and I don't know, let's say we're ending it. I, I like ending on at round times, even though it's never, like the recording is never round because there are always seconds of artifacts. So if people have questions, please ask away, and yeah, I will answer. I live to serve. Now, if you're seeing this on YouTube, you're seeing, um, and this is your first video, get used to the awkward pauses. These are not edited, and I need to, um, and I need to wait for people in chat to type questions. To type questions. Um, so if people don't have questions, um, I guess 8.25 is a good time to end. It's an hour 15 recording. Um, oh, which your cities are seeing the most jobs in city centers? I don't know. Right now, the answer is none because of corona-related artifacts. Um, I mean, if you go on the map and check, I, I would not know. Um, my, my understanding is that basically everywhere is seeing very slow... Okay, the problem with basically everywhere is that they have better Canadian data than this and American data. In Canada, by the way, um, cities are seeing that jobs fall. The proportion of jobs in city center is decreasing. Um, it's just, it's decreasing from a much higher level than is typical in most of the United States. Um, and um, so, so you want to see where there's comer down to commercial development. I mean, New York, I don't know. Uh, maybe Seattle, I'm not sure. Uh, San Francisco, actually, actually, probably since 2000 would have been San Francisco, I'm guessing, just because of the boom in the tech industry, um, which was, the, the, I mean, Facebook, I guess, was based in, um, the base itself in um, Menlo Park, but everything since Facebook, the third-gen tech firms, the ones that are generally founded by people who are not coder geeks like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, but by people who, th who see themselves as generic business founders. Um, these tend to be in... Uh, these tend to be in San Francisco, usually Selma. So Twitter, Uber, Airbnb, Slack, um, Salesforce. Uh, so it's a really good question. I'm sorry I can't give you an exact. Is it possible to reorient a week 
Oh, you mean do something where it gets where a weak centered city becomes satellite to a strong centered one? Let's call it let's call the weak centered one Providence or Worcester. Uh oh. Hi. I'm about to be done. Oh, like Los Angeles? No, Los Angeles is the primate city. I mean, the question is, can you make Los Angeles a more strongly centered city? Yes, you would need to build a much b bigger mass transit network. Um, let go of the tails. Um, pissing off people in the process. Most of it is just a matter of, matter of reducing construction costs and reducing leakage too. And um, then just building... Like, Los Angeles is horrifically nippy, which means that Los Angeles can't actually build its way into density because it builds so, 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 so little housing, whereas if it were EMBR, it would build, I mean, the, the EMB construction would be mostly in at least in your center areas, and that would just create more demand for offices. Maybe not downtown LA with the mass transit network they're trying to build, but things that are very central, so downtown LA, Koreatown for the western slash Vermont, no, western slash Vermont, Wiltshire slash Vermont uh, intersection, uh, things like that. Um, Replacing the, uh, replacing the um, golf courses next to uh, Century City with not golf with literally anything other than golf courses. Century City, you see, it's supposed to be the second downtown golf course, golf course. Uh, the, L L LA has horrific land use. Uh, Atlanta or Houston, I don't. Um, I don't know Atlanta and Houston as well as I know Los Angeles, and don't know Los Angeles as well as I know anything East Coast by pretty big margin. Um, like in Atlanta, there are bigger, there are better plans for this because Atlanta um, does have Marta and Houston has a much weaker light rail system. But I don't actually know. Sorry, I can't answer your questions. In, in Atlanta, I would go with like things in Atlanta. A lot of the high prestige employers are things like the CBC or Emory. So you want to do a kind of northeast bound, like a third metro line. I don't remember, but oh my god. What did you remind me? I want to think about happy things. Yeah, the, yeah. if it was in 1980, that's a really good uh, reason why I don't remember. Any US cities were housing in 1980? Yes! So, New York is pretty nimpy, but the Jersey side of it isn't. And actually, there's a lot of housing growth in Jersey City. Jersey City is a very nimpy. Uh, it's, it's very small, but it's very nimpy. Uh, Seattle is not very, but it's pretty MB. Um, maybe Portland, I'm not sure. Um, these are the examples that I would look for. Yeah, Seattle is, um, bear in mind, um, so Austin has had a lot of multifamily development. I think in the early to mid-2010s, actually Austin beat uh, Seattle on apartments per capita. A new apartments per capita, but it's apartments that are okay. You're just building some kind of four story build, some four story apartment building out in the boondocks, and everyone's gonna die. It's not actually TOD. Okay, this is not gonna actually get you what you need because of the. No. Let's see what this is. Um, so let's go off camera for a sec. Okay. Um, yeah, but this is for freeways. Anyway, uh, Back on camera. Yeah. Um, so yeah, LA is. Um, you can spell. You can spell it for LA. Essentially, just like the land values are so crazy, the rents are extremely high. Even though it's not an especially wealthy city like San Francisco or New York, but um, the but, but the upshot is that it's something that is fixable in LA. It just like, none of the city elites is interested in doing so. Again, LA is the Navy capital of California, the NBSM in San Francisco and San Diego.
How was Seattle doing for transit expansion? Um, it was starting to. It was doing very well, and now the construction costs are troubling. And by troubling, I mean world beating for majority not underground. San Francisco, I mean, I shouldn't say San Francisco is Yimby, right? Nothing about California is Yimby. But the mayor of San, of San Diego did call himself a Yimby, and um, the big opposition to SB 50 was mostly LA, not San Diego. I remember also that SB 50 won in NorCal. Um, like, a majority of legislators based in NorCal voted for it. It was SoCal, mostly LA that derived it. Anyway, um, I'm going to ask one last time about questions, and if there aren't any, then we can stop. Now I'm doing somewhat shorter videos, but more of them. I'm going to give people like a minute or two to type, because I'm not saying, it's not, it's not the messenger, right? I mean, on instant messenger or in a... Did I see the new cost for the Ontario line? Uh, yeah, some of them. I, I, I saw that the segments were uh, careening past a billion dollars per kilometer. I uh, love Canada. I really love Canada. Um, I especially love how Canada, for, for a country that uh, keeps calling itself better than the United States, is exactly the same as the United States on certain things. Um, are there other questions? Sorry if I'm yawning, but I'll get better. Thanks for watching, Sonny. Um, and thanks to everyone else. So yeah, we'll see you um, with another topic on Tuesday. And oh, what do you think about the new business district in Beijing? I don't know. Um, I'm actually much more familiar with the Jiazui than with um, the ones in Beijing. Um, because in, in Jiazui, I would just say it's literally across the river from the Bund. So it's actually much more like La Défense and like something really out in the boonies. I, I do not know Beijing at all. Um, so, so I can't actually answer questions about Beijing, I'm sorry. I know that Beijing is trying to have like a slightly gritty subway system, although gritty or not gritty, I can see the subway system and see exactly where city center is, historically at least. Um, So anyway, thanks everyone, and I'll see you on Tuesday with another topic, the topic being uh, the same thing I just talked to you about, but at intercity and national scale. Um, and if Europe actually gets its act together and builds good cross-border rail, then EO scale. So, ciao, ciao.